On November 17, 1987, a young Canadian couple named J. Rollin Cook, 20, and Tanya Van Quilenborg, 18, embarked on a romantic overnight road trip from Saanich, British Columbia to Seattle, Washington. However, their journey took a sinister turn when they mysteriously vanished, never reaching their intended destination. Even a thorough investigation could not offer concrete answers to what happened to them. The truth finally emerged after 31 long years, revealing a harrowing tale of deception, manipulation, and a cold-blooded killer lurking in the shadows. Why did the young couple never make it to their destination? Why did it take so long to unravel the mystery? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook, where we shed light on mysterious cases from across the country. Today we'll delve into the unsettling case of J. Rollin Cook and Tanya Van Quilenborg, a 31-year-old case that was finally solved in 2022 thanks to technological breakthroughs in forensic science. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to our channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell icon below, as it motivates us to create more intriguing content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Saget County is located in the northwestern part of the state of Washington, USA. It is known for its picturesque landscapes, shaped by the Saget River and the Cascade Mountains. The county is home to several charming towns and communities, such as Mount Vernon, Ana Cortez, and Cedro Woodley. Lush with forest and waterways, Saget County offers many outdoor recreational activities, including hiking, fishing, boating, and bird watching. No one would ever guess that a place this beautiful has been holding the dark secrets of a mysterious crime for over 30 years. Tanya Van Quallenberg was born on March 7, 1969 in Victoria, British Columbia. She grew up in a loving household with her parents, Willem and Jean Van Quallenberg, and she shared an idyllic childhood full of laughter with her older brother, John. Tanya's family had a love for adventure and often enjoyed long boating trips across the beautiful Salish Sea, creating cherished memories together. Two of Tanya's favorite pastimes were sailing and strumming melodies on her guitar. She also found joy in playing tennis on their spacious one-acre property. She was a determined student who advocated for a girls basketball team at her high school, showing her passion for equality and sports. She did play tennis and basketball, and but uh, socializing with her friends uh, was a, a big part of her life. And uh... Tanya had a soft spot for animals and longed for a furry companion. Finally, in 1982, her mother gave in, and a golden retriever named Tessa joined the family. Caring for our family golden retriever uh, and other pets was a, a real passion of hers. Becoming Tanya's faithful and beloved pet, Tanya dreamed of working with animals, possibly as a veterinarian. J. Rollin Cook was born in December 16, 1966, in Saanich, British Columbia. He grew up in a warm, close-knit family with two loving sisters, Laura Lee and Kelly, and their parents Gordon and Leona Cook. Standing at an impressive height of 6 foot 4, J. possessed a lanky frame at 20 and had yet to fully develop into his adult physique. Jay was not just an ordinary young man from Vancouver Island. He had a passion for music and had mastered playing the bass guitar, rocking out with his friends. Jay was the type who was quiet, but someone who you wanted in your circle, someone that you wanted to be friends with because he'd take the shirt off his back and give it to you if you needed it. He's the type that it avoided a fight. He wasn't the type that would go out and initiate any sort of physical violence with anybody. He was working at a pizza parlor and was known for his dedication. Once, he biked through rain and darkness for three long hours while balancing a whole pizza just to surprise his friends staying at a cabin. However, Jay had a peculiar quirk of misplacing his clothes and often returned home without his jacket, feeling puzzled about its whereabouts. He possessed a heart of gold and frequently treated his younger sister to special outings like dinners and high tea using the hard-earned money he made at the pizza parlor. He aspired to become a marine biologist. 
Jay and Tanya's paths crossed in the halls of Oak Bay High School, igniting a connection that would shape their lives. Despite being two years older than her, Jay was captivated by Tanya's charm. By May 1987, with Tanya on the brink of graduation, their friendship blossomed into a romance. They met through some mutual friends. They'd both gone to the same high school in Victoria, and uh, they'd been dating about five or six months at the time. Although their future plans were not set in stone, their dreams held the promise of a meaningful and exciting future. Through it all, the young couple radiated happiness, earning the admiration of their family, who saw the love they shared. Their relationship had spanned only six beautiful months when tragedy befell and snatched away the young couple's promising future together. On the chilly morning of November 18, 1987, Jay woke up excited about picking up his girlfriend, Tanya, and embarking on a road trip from British Columbia to Seattle in his father's shiny copper brown 1977 Ford Club van. Jay's father, Gordon, who ran his own business, required furnace parts worth $750 from Genesco Heating in Seattle. His father owned a heating business and they had a job that they were working on where they needed some furnace parts in Seattle. He asked Jay to collect the parcel from Seattle as it was already going there with Tanya. The couple got ready for their cross-border road trip, excited about the long hours they would spend in each other's company. Tanya also packed her camera, a Minolta X700 with a 35 millimeter lens hoping to capture some memorable photos of their time together. After a smooth ferry ride on the MV Coho from Victoria to Port Angeles on the Washington coast, Jay and Tanya continued their journey along Route 101 toward Bremerton. However, they accidentally missed the exit of the Hood Canal floating bridge and found themselves in the charming town of Hoodsport by 8 p.m. Seeking guidance, they entered Hoodsport Grocery where they encountered a friendly store clerk named Judith Stone, who helped them with directions. As the evening unfolded, Jay and Tanya continued their journey and arrived at the peaceful town of Alan. They stopped at Ben's Deli Mart for some food at 9.29 p.m. The friendly clerk at the deli noted that the couple appeared calm and relaxed, traveling without any companions. It was late in the evening, well past 10 p.m., when Jay and Tanya finally reached Bremerton and purchased a ferry ticket to Seattle for the next day. Their plan was to find a suitable spot to park their van and spend the night before continuing their journey the next morning to collect the parcel. The next day, November 19, 1987, they boarded the ferry from Bremerton to Seattle, ready to continue their adventure. However, destiny had something unexpected in store for them, as this was the last time they were seen. They never reached Genesco Heating to pick up the parcel. They were scheduled to return home that same evening, but to the dismay of their families, they never arrived. Tanya's older brother, John Van Quilenborg, was away at college when he received an alarming phone call from their concerned father, Willem. Tanya and Jay had not returned home and had not called to inform of any change in plans. My dad called and asked whether I'd heard anything from Tanya and Jay. I think they were hoping that maybe by chance they decided to come home a different route. This unusual silence worried both families, who knew Tanya and Jay were responsible young people and would always call if they were going to be late. When they didn't return home, my parents were quite certain that there was something wrong. It was very out of character for Tanya to not be in communication. I mean, this was pre-cell phones at this point in time, but still the, the family expectation that we had at that time was if your plan was gonna change like that, you had to at least phone in, tell the parents what was going on. Despite their growing concern, their parents clung to the hope that maybe the van had broken down and left the couple stranded without access to a phone. As the morning of November 20th arrived, Without any word from Tanya and Jay, a wave of panic washed over their families. The unsettling silence drove them to report their beloved children as missing. Initially on that uh, Thursday, my dad started to approach the local police saying they were missing and, and started the process, so to speak. This sparked a massive search operation as the Royal Canadian Mounted Police contacted the Seattle Police Department about the missing couple. 
Determined to find their children, the families went to great lengths and even hired a plane to soar above the area where Tanya and Jay had last been seen, hoping for a glimpse of their van amid the vast expanse. You know, it takes them a while to be convinced, I think, that there's something in this because there was really no evidence of anything being wrong yet. Um, you had a couple of quite young kids, a few hours overdue. I think it was a bit of an uphill battle that my dad had convincing the police of that. Someone he knew had a small aircraft who did some search by aircraft over the Olympic Peninsula and across over Seattle through the Olympic Mountains. From that distance or range, they were looking for the van. For the investigators, the search for Jay and Tanya was like unraveling a complex puzzle. With no trace of the couple and no clues to guide them, the police faced a challenging task. Step by step, they retraced the path Jay and Tanya had taken, reconstructing their trip to try and unlock the secrets behind their sudden disappearance. They boarded a ferry that runs regularly between Victoria and Port Angeles on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, which is part of Washington State. So they took the ferry across to Port Angeles, cleared customs, and then started driving down the peninsula. There were two witnesses that had seen them at sort of mom and pop grocery stores on the peninsula. So that told us that they traveled through Hood's Port, through Allen. And then, of course, we knew that they had at least purchased a ferry ticket to cross from Bremerton to Seattle. After nearly a week of uncertainty, fate dealt a devastating blow. On November 24, 1987, a passerby gathering cans in Skagit County stumbled upon a heart-wrenching scene. Beside a weathered culvert along Parson Creek Road, some 80 miles north of Seattle, lay the lifeless body of Tanya Van Quilenborg. She was found unclothed from the waist down. The shocking cause of death was soon uncovered. A single gunshot to the back of her head, inflicted with a 38 caliber bullet. That evening, with a heavy heart, John took the somber responsibility of identifying his sister's lifeless form. My mom, earlier that afternoon, had received a call from the Skagit County Sheriff's Department saying that they'd recovered a body that they thought might be Tanya, but there was no identification with the body. And so they were wanting a family member to come identify the body. And it was a very quiet, somber drive. You know, very difficult time. You're hoping that it's not Tanya, but uh, you know, you, after you know, not having any other answers, there's a bit of a sinking feeling that uh, this may well be the answer, but we're very quiet. There wasn't a lot to be said between the four of us. And, uh, you know, um, and um, unfortunately, after we got to, uh, got to Cedar Woolley and uh, my dad and I together identified Tanya's body. And she wasn't battered or beaten in that sense, but unfortunately was lifeless. It was very hard for me to see how, how devastated my parents were uh, from this, but there's nothing I could do to fix it, so other than spend time with them. As Chief Deputy Ron Panzero of the Skagit County Sheriff's Office described, Tanya's body was found with the distressing signs of a violent attack. A trace of another person's DNA was recovered from inside her body. During the investigation, a dedicated volunteer named Jennifer Sheehan Lee, discovered a shell casing from a 38 caliber bullet not far from Prairie Road. The area for about 25 feet around the body to see if anything obvious or unusual was there. I found what appeared to be brain tissue, like something had leaked out of the uh, gunshot wound, and that was collected. Along the road, the officers found plastic ties commonly used for bundling wires, which they believed were used to restrain Tanya in the van. At the top, uh, just looking, I found a pair of zip ties that were discarded, fairly close to the road, actually. As the investigation deepened, the detectives couldn't ignore the puzzling absence of Jay in the van. Their suspicion immediately turned toward Jay as a potential suspect in Tanya's tragic murder. However, both families vehemently disagreed with this notion. 
as they knew Tanya and Jay were intensely devoted to each other and deeply in love. Their relationship had been filled with joy and had never exhibited any signs of trouble or violence. On November 25, 1987, a day after Tanya's body was found, a perplexing discovery shed new light on the case. The authorities located Jay's van in a bustling parking lot in downtown Bellingham in Whatcom County, 90 miles north from Seattle. The detective scoured the surrounding area and stumbled upon a treasure trove of evidence just two blocks away from the van. Tanya's wallet, ID card, driving license, the van's keys, and most importantly, a box of bullets that seemed to be of 38 caliber had been discarded near the Greyhound station in Bellingham, approximately 16 miles from where Tanya's body had been found. A woman who worked at Essie's Tavern in the city of Belling was out on the back porch and she and another employee found several items, namely a purse that had Tanya's identification in it. And in further searching, keys to the van were found under the porch along with surgical gloves, a partial box of ammunition, zip ties, and a lens cap for a Minolta camera. Curiously, these items were found hidden beneath the porch of a local tavern named Essie's, adjacent to the busy Greyhound bus station. Inside the van, they made a series of unsettling discoveries. They found zip ties in Tanya's black pants, which raised their suspicions. The money order for Janesco was still inside, unused, a stained comforter, and a used tampon were evidence of a distressing struggle. And we examined the, anything we could find inside the van. There was some blood on the middle seat or what appeared to be a blood stain. In the back of the van, they found a pair of black pants, which appeared to be a pair of female pants. And they found a used tampon sort of back in the, the rear compartment near the spare tire. The presence of orange camel cigarette butts in an ashtray hinted at a connection to a third person and possible killer in the van since Tanya and Jay never smoked. Authorities also found a pair of surgical gloves that they believed the killer had donned to avoid leaving behind any telltale fingerprints. Also in the van were various receipts, including the ferry ticket from Bremerton to Seattle, confirming that Jay and Tanya had indeed taken the second ferry as a part of their journey. There was a fuel receipt indicating that the couple had stopped to purchase fuel along the road between Port Angeles and Bremerton. These findings provided valuable clues and helped the investigators piece together the timeline of their travels. However, one significant item was missing. The Minolta X700 35mm camera that Tanya had brought along their journey. Tragically, on November 26, 1987, a group of pheasant hunters made a grim discovery. The lifeless body of Jay Cook concealed under the majestic high bridge overlooking the Snoqualmie River in Snohomish County. His head and torso were carefully covered with a blue blanket, and investigators who gently unveiled the blanket were met by a horrifying sight. His upper body was covered in a blue fleece blanket, so you couldn't see a lot at first other than his legs sticking out from the blanket. They start to remove the blanket, and they quickly realize that there's a lot of blood he has numerous wounds on his head, on his ear. It appears there's a ligature. Jay had suffered severe head injuries from a beating, and his life had been cruelly cut short by strangulation with twine tied to two vivid red dog collars. On top of that, a pack of camel lights and some tissues had been forcefully pushed down his throat. They tied twine and a dog collar around his neck and strangled him, and they'd also beat him in the head with rocks. It was a very violent murder. They could see in his mouth at the time was what appeared to be a pack of cigarettes. There was a tissue that was stuffed down Jay's throat. Sergeant Robert Bart from the Sonomish County Sheriff's Office noted that Jay's hands had been bound with plastic ties, similar to the ones found near Tanya's body, which is often a sign of an individual with a criminal past. What added to the intrigue was the location where Jay's body had been found in Monroe Honor Farm, just a few miles away from Monroe Correctional Prison. Detective Jim Scharf of the Sonomish County Sheriff's Office 
had a sinking feeling that the perpetrator could be a seasoned predator, even a serial killer. The search for the double murder posed a daunting challenge to investigators and forensic scientists. The four crime scenes were spread across three counties, Saget, Sohomish, and Whatcom. A small glimmer of hope emerged when the bullet casing discovered near Tanya's body was found to match the bullets recovered at the tavern in Bellingham. Unfortunately, the murder weapon used to shoot Tanya remained elusive. Among the various leads that were found at the crime scene were blood-stained rocks that investigators had meticulously collected from the surrounding grass where Jay's body had been found. Forensics also discovered a palm print on the back of the van, which they hoped belonged to the killer. In their search for clues, the police focused on the black pants found in the van. They sent the pants to the medical examiner's office for analysis, hoping to uncover a new lead. Upon examination, forensic experts found traces of bodily fluid on the pants. More significantly, the DNA profile obtained from the bodily fluid did not match Jay's, but it did match the unknown DNA recovered from inside Tanya's body. Investigators believe that this mysterious DNA sample was their link to the murderer, referred to as Individual A. The investigation faced a significant challenge as the only evidence leaking all four crime scenes were the plastic zip ties discovered near Tanya's and Jay's bodies, as well as under the porch and inside the van. Detective Scharf believed these zip ties were part of the killer's sinister toolkit for committing his heinous acts. Tanya and Jay described as a mild-mannered and soft-spoken were not seeking conflict with anyone. The devastating impact of their loss was felt deeply by both families. In a desperate attempt to bring the killer to justice, Tanya's family offered a reward of $50,000 for any valuable information. Although tips poured in from far and wide, none of them yielded the breakthrough they were hoping for. On December 5, 1987, a heartfelt memorial service took place at the University of Victoria's Interfaith Chapel, honoring the memory of Jay and Tanya. There was a memorial service for her at the University of Victoria at the Interfaith Chapel, and uh, it was uh, it was a yeah it was a good service. A number of people spoke. There was a, a lot of people there because of you know Tanya, as I say, was quite social. So she had all you know a lot of young people. A lot of her friends were there. I mean, the community was in shock. I mean, for these two kids to have gone missing and both found murdered, it was uh, so it was a. There was a lot of people there, as, as happens in these situations. So hard to understand, so hard to fathom how you could, uh, you know, raise kids like that. And then for no apparent reason then, and really as of today, still no apparent reason, um, have them taken in such a brutal way. So it, it would just devastated both of them and, uh, yeah, changed their outlook on life. And yeah, definitely had a massive impact on them. Just four weeks after the murders, during the Christmas holidays in December 1987, Jay and Tanya's families received the first of a series of chilling greeting cards by an anonymous writer. These cards were filled with disturbing descriptions of the murders and signed by someone claiming to be their killer. Some of these cards were even signed with the names of the victims as Tanya and Jay. Even more unsettling, was that the cards were sent from different cities across the United States, including New York, Los Angeles, and Seattle. Started receiving Christmas cards or holiday cards from someone. Just, you know, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, happy Halloween, or whatever. The letters were really unusual because they were coming to the family on holidays and Mother's Day and they were being mailed from different parts of the United States, like New York, San Diego, and Seattle. The writer of these cards went to the extent of sending letters to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and a British Columbia newspaper, seemingly finding joy in causing distress and chaos. The already grieving families were further shattered by this terrifying turn of events. Detectives suspected that the author might be a transient traveling along the West Coast, but the grammar and punctuation in the letters hinted at a Canadian education. Phrases like greetings and salutations and hallelujah bloody Jesus caught their attention. 
As the investigation progressed, authorities worked diligently to collect evidence and conduct DNA tests in the laboratory. They also made a public plea to the letter writer, urging him to provide information about the whereabouts of the lake where he claimed to have left his car during the crimes. While there was a possibility that the letter writer could be the killer, detectives believed it was more likely the work of a misguided individual. This was confirmed when the DNA extracted from one such letter failed to match the individual A DNA from the crime scene. In 1995, a dedicated cold case team led by Snohomish County Detective Jim Scharf was formed with a mission to provide long-awaited justice for grieving families. One of these cases that caught their attention was the double murder of Tanya and Jay. It was then that a new name emerged for a potential suspect, Charles Thurman Sinclair. Charles Sinclair was a notorious figure in Western United States, earning the chilling nickname of the coin shop killer. His criminal activities were not typically thefts, but rather the calculated actions of a serial killer who targeted coin dealers and shop owners. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Sinclair terrorized the region, leaving a trail of fear in his wake. The complexity of his crimes initially led investigators to treat them as separate incidents in different states. However, a survivor's description eventually connected the crimes, prompting investigators from multiple states to collaborate and bring the coin shop killer to justice. Sinclair was finally arrested in Alaska in 1990, prompted by a survivor's description, but passed away later that year from a heart attack. Sinclair was suspected of being involved in 11 homicides, but his sudden death meant that the true extent of his crimes could never be revealed. The detectives working on Jay and Tanya's cold case initially believed he might be connected to the double murder given the circumstances of the killing in 1987. However, unlike other serial killers, Sinclair's motive was primarily financial gain by targeting coin shops and dealers for money. In Tanya and Jay's case, all the money they had been carrying, including Tanya's wallet and the money order in the van, had been left untouched. The detectives then dismissed this theory and began looking elsewhere for clues. For more than 20 years, the murder of the Canadian couple remained a puzzle. In 2003, forensic scientist Lisa Collins from the Washington State Patrol joined the investigation and decided to use modern technology to uncover new leads. She focused on analyzing the DNA profile, known as Individual A, which was obtained from bodily fluid found at the crime scene. Collins uploaded this profile to CODIS, the FBI's National Offender Database, hoping to find a match. Despite her thorough analysis and efforts, the database did not provide any matches at that time. Despite the DNA mismatch between individual A and the letter writer, the police considered the writer as a suspect and wanted him to come forward in case he had some information. A breakthrough occurred when a Canadian resident recognized the handwriting while watching the TV show Washington's Most Wanted and contacted the police anonymously. The tipster provided the suspect's name, which was found in the case files through a database search. Detectives tracked down the transient suspect on October 20, 2010, who apologized and cited mental illness and years of homelessness as reasons for his erratic behavior. Years passed with no breakthrough in the case, leaving the detectives frustrated. Then in 2018, Detective Jim Scharf learned about snapshot phenotyping, a new tool that used DNA evidence to predict a suspect's physical appearance. Working with Parabon Nanolabs, they analyzed the DNA samples from individual A and created composite sketches of the suspect at the ages of 25, 45, and 65. Despite releasing the sketches to the public and receiving almost 70 leads, none provided a solid clue or name. But a surprising arrest in California that same year offered a glimmer of hope for law enforcement. A dangerous criminal who went by various names such as the Visala Ransacker, the original Night Stalker, and the Diamond Knot Killer, had been causing fear and terror in California for a long time. Spread across 15 different areas, his crimes amounted to more than 50 assaults and 13 murders. 
he became known as the Golden State Killer and haunted people like an invisible phantom for over four decades. The detectives considered the possibility that Tanya and Jay might have been victims of this notorious killer, but the evidence from the crime scene and the killer's methods were different from those linked to the Golden State Killer. In 2018, the Golden State Killer finally ran out of luck in evading capture. Using a genetic database called GED Match, investigators identified Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. as the Golden State Killer, even though he had previously been ruled out as a suspect. This arrest inspired Detective Jim Scharf to consider using the same technology in his investigation. In 2013, Chelsea Rustad, a 31-year-old resident of Tumwater in Washington, began exploring her family history and connected with distant relatives on social media. She identified the Talbot siblings from Snohomish County as her second cousins and got in touch with the two sisters online. But their brother was absent from social media. In 2015, she entered an Ancestry DNA contest by submitting a photo of herself at age five, dressed as a ballerina on Halloween. That photo must have been a lucky charm because out of hundreds of entries, Chelsea won a free DNA test kit. I saw on Ancestry's Facebook page, they were running a contest and uh, two winners would receive an Ancestry DNA kit. They contacted me and said, Chelsea, you're one of the winners. The Ancestry DNA kit arrived. You just kind of spit in a tube and seal it up, and then it was on its way. And posted her results on GED Match, a DNA database website. Little did she know, a new story was unfolding in the police forensic department as she spent time on the site. In 2018, Parabon Nano Labs uploaded individual A's DNA to GED Match seeking answers in Jay and Tanya's case. C.C. Moore, a genetic genealogist, took on the challenge. The case held personal significance for her as she was born the same year as Tanya and felt determined to bring closure to their murder mystery. After a tense night on April 27, 2018, C.C. found two individuals in the DNA database who shared enough DNA with individual A to qualify as second cousins. However, they were related to him on different branches of his family tree. CC had to trace those branches back to identify the common ancestor and uncover individual A's identity. I found her birth date, so I put that in here. And then I said she shared 3.35% of her DNA with our unknown suspect. Now I have to identify her parents. Who are her grandparents? Well, I recognized Talbot immediately from the other matches family tree. So right away, I knew, aha, this marriage combines the two different families that I'm researching. So then we follow that forward. We say, okay, Patricia Peters married a Talbot and they had four kids. And we've got one male. Her determination increasing with every second, Cece uncovered a web of connections and found a unique name among the cousins. Within two hours, she built the family tree and discovered the suspect's name. When the police arrived at the cousin's address, they knew they were in the right place. The door opened to reveal Chelsea Rustad, and the suspect was none other than her mysterious second cousin, William Earl Talbot II, who had no presence on social media. William Earl Talbot II was born in 1969 to William Earl Talbot Sr. and Patricia Peters. William had a regular job as a trucker and enjoyed riding motorcycles and socializing with friends. He lived in a pleasant home near Seattle Tacoma Airport and had a clean record except for a few minor arrests. From a young age, he displayed anger issues and aggressive behavior. Talbot's younger sister, Melina Grail, recalled incidents where he had kicked her with boots on and exhibited entitled behavior. Bill had a lot of anger issues and kicked me a few times with boots on and I ended up calling the police. She also mentioned an incident from when Talbot was 11 years old and had allegedly pushed their disabled father. Despite counseling, his behavior did not improve. As Talbot grew older, his behavior became increasingly violent. At 16 years old, he expressed his intention to run over his father with a car. 
he assaulted his sister Inga multiple times, once when she was 11 and again when she turned 15, causing serious injuries, including a broken tailbone. Talbot also dropped the family cat into a well, requiring his father to retrieve it and clean the well. Due to his violent actions, Talbot became estranged from his family for nearly two decades. Ignoring their attempts to reach out to him, he even neglected important events such as his mother's funeral and only sporadically contacted his family on special occasions. Despite his clean record, the police had finally caught up to the killer and all evidence was pointing directly at William Earl Talbot II. For years, he managed to stay unnoticed, living a regular life as a truck driver without any online footprint, but now his true identity was unraveling. Detectives discovered that Talbot had grown up just a few miles away from Jay Cook's body was found, a crucial connection. Detective Scharf faced a critical task. He had to make sure that DNA found at the crime scene belonged to William Talbot. To gather evidence, investigators closely followed Talbot on his trucking routes until an opportunity arose. One fateful day in May 2018, Talbot unknowingly dropped a cup he had been drinking from at a traffic signal and drove away. Racing against time, investigators promptly delivered the cup to the Washington State Patrol Lab. With anticipation building, everyone held their breath, awaiting the results that would either confirm or dispel their suspicions. The state crime lab swiftly tested the cup and confirmed the detective's suspicions. Talbot's DNA matched the evidence from the crime scenes. Detective Scharf was in disbelief upon hearing the news, feeling a rush of emotions. A really, really powerful moment in my life. My eyes teared up and I yelled out a scream and said, we got him. After nearly three decades of anguish and years of relentless work, they had the killer at last. On May 17, 2018, around 6 p.m., William Talbot II was arrested. He was charged for kidnapping, assault, murder, and robbery in Saget County Superior Court for the death of Tanya Van Quilenberg. Later on June 15, 2018, the charge for Jay Cook's murder was added in Sonomish County Superior Court, as confirmed by Sonomish County Sheriff Ty Trinnery. The trial of William Talbot began on June 11, 2019, in Sonomish County Superior Court. He pleaded not guilty to two counts of aggravated murder. The prosecution, led by Deputy Prosecutor Matt Baldock, presented DNA evidence, Talbot's proximity to the crime scene, and the presence of zip ties as evidence against him. However, Talbot's defense attorneys, Rachel Ford and John Scott, worked to challenge the DNA evidence and create doubt in the jury's minds. They argued that the DNA evidence was not strong enough to prove Talbot's guilt. During the trial, Dr. Eric Kiesel, a former medical examiner, showed autopsy photos of Jay Cook highlighting his suffering. However, the defense pointed out that Kiesel had previously estimated a longer time of death. Raising questions about the timeline, Kiesel clarified that the estimate was not based on solid evidence. Talbot's former roommate, Michael Seat, testified about their friendship and shared memories of snorkeling and doing photography together. As the trial unfolded, another former roommate, Timothy McPherson, came forward and described Talbot as heavy and strong, mentioning that they used to go bowling together. McPherson also stated that he had never seen Talbot with guns, blue blankets, dog collars, or zip ties, and had never seen him smoke. These testimonies conflicted with the prosecution's evidence of Talbot's history of aggressive behavior. The trial grew intense when Talbot's defense team claimed that the detectives had tunnel vision and had overlooked the possibility of another person leaving the DNA evidence at the crime scene. Prosecutor Mark Baldock countered by questioning the plausibility of certain scenarios presented by the defense. Another point of contention was the palm print found on the Ford van's back door, which was initially deemed a mismatch for Talbot, but later identified as a match. The defense questioned the timing of this charge, but did not challenge the final conclusion in court. The defense also suggested the idea of a consensual relationship between Talbot and Tanya as the reason for his DNA at the crime scene, and argued that the unidentified killer 
and later murdered the couple without leaving any DNA behind. But Talbot denied having any relationship with Tanya, leaving the jurors puzzled about his true intentions and struggling to understand how the evidence fit together. Finally, after just 30 minutes of deliberation, the jury reached a unanimous guilty verdict, sealing Talbot's fate. We, the jury, find the defendant, William Earl Talbot II, guilty of the crime of first-degree yes. murder as charged in Chapa. Their decision was solely based on the concrete evidence presented by the prosecution in court. Later, during a private meeting with the lawyers, the jury learned that the zip ties found in the victim's van also contained DNA traces that potentially matched Talbot's DNA, providing further proof against him. On July 24, 2019, William Talbot II was sentenced, concluding a groundbreaking trial where a jury found him guilty of homicide. Despite a last-minute attempt by his defense team for a new trial, the judge dismissed their argument, emphasizing the importance of considering evidence in a broader context. Jay Cook's sister also took the stand to highlight Talbot's role in ending the lives of two young people. The judge sentenced Talbot to life in prison without parole, despite the defense attorney's statement about his unremarkable life and perceived lack of cruelty. Tanya's close friend expressed satisfaction with the verdict, but acknowledged the lasting sorrow of losing Tanya to such unspeakable violence. In 2020, Talbot filed an appeal arguing against the use of DNA evidence in his case. He wrote, based on Snohomish County's way of thinking, the only possible suspect is the source of that blood, regardless of all other evidence or lack of. He claimed that the DNA alone should not make someone the only possible suspect, disregarding other evidence. On December 6, 2021, concerns were raised about a juror's ability to remain impartial due to emotional influences. Talbot's defense team appealed, claiming bias in an unfair trial. The appeals court agreed, stating that the jurors' comments showed actual bias and had not been addressed adequately. The prosecution vehemently opposed the court's decision to overturn Talbot's conviction. As their argument was unsuccessful, the case was taken to the Supreme Court, which upheld the original decision and reinstated Talbot's conviction on December 22, 2022. As a result, Talbot will serve his life sentence without parole at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. Chelsea Rustad, Talbot's second cousin, found closure as she connected with the families of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Quallenberg. Attending the sentencing, she offered support to the families and noted the absence of Talbot's relatives. Rustad wrote a book titled Inherited Secrets about the experience of discovering her relation to a cold-blooded killer. Talbot's conviction brought a sense of closure to the families, providing them with peace after decades of pain and uncertainty. The double murder of Tanya Van Quallenberg and Jay Cook was a case that tested boundaries of forensic science. What are your thoughts on this case? Share your opinion in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.